This conference will now be recorded. So, uh, I welcome you all to this uh, workshop from from the Iris project uh, on the battery energy storage systems. Uh, in the Iris project, the three lighthouse cities of Utrecht, Nice, and uh, Gothenburg are demonstrating many innovative solutions that supporting their uh, transition to smart and sustainable cities. But um, in particular, the battery energy storage system are, is a unique uh, case because it is demonstrated in uh, in all three in all three cities, and it is also an element that is demonstrated in many smart cities and communities uh, projects uh, in Europe. So, in this workshop, our partners from Utrecht, Nice, and Gothenburg will present will share their experience from the implementation of stationary, stationary electricity storage, both in district and uh, building level. Uh, the agenda of the event. Uh, in, in the beginning, we will have an, a short introduction to battery energy storage systems from my colleague, uh, Vasilis uh, Sugaikis. And, uh, after, after that, uh, we will have different use cases in the uh, city of Utrecht from Bart van der Rie of Loboxnet, in Nice from Christian Kame, uh, FDF, and in uh, Gothenburg. In partic uh, from Gothenburg, we will have two cases one in Housing Association Viva, presented by Pierre Halt, and uh, one in, uh, in the a working lab building uh, of Academic Cahus from Per uh, sorry <laughs> Per Lover <laughs> Lover read Love ride <laughs> Thank you and uh, after uh, these presentations we will have uh, discussion questions and uh, and answer answers and before uh, to give the floor to Vasilis to, for the introduction, I will also uh, want to present you the fact sheet that we uh, all together created uh, for the battery energy storage systems. Um, this fact sheet presents the experiences in three in the three lighthouse cities, but not only the technical solution; it also presents. Uh, societal, user and business aspects, the expected impacts of the demonstrations and, uh, and lessons learned. The, this fact sheet is available on the IRIS uh, website. So thank you all for your effort to, pre to prepare the fact sheet and also to prepare this, uh, this workshop. Vasilis? Let me make you a presenter. Yes, uh, thank you, Panos. I will. Uh, please. please let me know if you can see my screen. Not yet. Yes. Okay, <clears throat> so I uh, will start with a short introduction on stationary battery storage systems in order to give the context for the case studies that we'll see in the next presentations. Um, as we all know, the world is uh, aiming towards more sustainable energy systems and battery storage is a key technology to achieve this. Uh, the EU has set ambitious targets for 2030 to reduce its greenhouse gas emissions by 40% compared to 1990 levels, as well as increase the share of renewable energy sources in the final energy consumption. So it is apparent that the energy transition will lead to a great increase in renewable energy sources. Uh, however, renewable energies are re variable, variable in nature, and uh, the energy production does not always meet the demand, the energy demand. So the role of electricity storage is uh, critical in ensuring its system flexibility and power quality uh, in, energy, in an energy system with increased levels of uh, renewable energy sources. Uh, there are various technologies um, and various applications for energy storage. 
So today we're focusing on stationary battery system installed um, mainly on the consumer side behind the meter. Uh, battery systems are suitable for providing short and flexibility in a scale from hours to days. They are also modular systems, which means that they can be easily expanded and relocated from one side to another. And they're suitable for small scale applications, ranging from few kilowatts to bulk storage applications. And therefore they can be used, um, they're applicable to end users, network operators and utilities. So they uh, can be used throughout the whole value chain of the electricity generation and supply and uh, have uh, significant benefits uh, on the on these users so the battery systems have benefits that can be grouped based on the stakeholders that they are applicable to so uh, behind the meter storage systems can increase the self-consumption of renewable energy sources and provide backup power to consumers to end users during blackouts they may also uh, lead to cost savings when, uh, as well as demand charge reduction. So you can uh, you can store electricity during off peak hours when the cost of electricity is lower and use it later on when in peak hours when the cost is higher. Uh, with regard to mini grids, uh, battery storage system can also lead to replacement of diesel generators and facilitate and smoothen the integration of renewable energy sources. And they can also provide backup power as well in cases of blackouts. While for system operation, for the transmission and distribution system operators, uh, battery systems can uh, may participate in, provided that they participate in ancillary market, uh, ancillary services market, they can facilitate through frequency regulation, as well as delay any network upgrade investments or uh, lead to peak capacity investment deferral. The main components of battery systems are the battery pack, which contains all the cells that are connected to each other, so that the suitable voltage and current uh, are, is achieved. And along with the battery management system and the thermal management system, which uh, basically protect the cells from harmful operation and balancing the state of charge, as well as regulates the temperature and temperature grad gradients in the cells. The system also includes the power electronics for uh, converting uh, the power into AC and controlling and monitoring the voltage and um, fans and as well as other components in the system. And finally, there's a, a software layer where all the system monitoring and energy management that monitors and regulates the power flow according to the specific applications. So there are various types of batteries uh, based on their chemistries uh, that are used for various applications. The main types of uh, batteries that are used in building uh, applications are lead acid batteries as long as some types of lithium ion batteries. Um, while other other chemistries that can be used that are used uh, in other applications are sulfur based and cadmium based so in order to select uh, the bat a specific battery for a specific application uh, there are several characteristics that need to be considered such as the rat trip efficiency the response time the lifetime and useful cycles of charging and discharging as well as the energy density and specific power capacity and safety and eco-friendliness. So as mentioned before, the main types of batteries that are used in building applications are lead acid with uh, lithium batteries. The lead acid batteries have lower capital costs and high charge discharge rate, while lithium batteries have low operating costs and higher energy densities. Uh, over the past years, um, lithium batteries have been gaining uh, great higher market shares and are being used uh, are, be, are being used more than lead acid batteries. And uh, they have, uh, as we can see, they have a favorable performance compared to lead acid batteries in terms of their energy density 
both volumetric and gravimetric, as well as efficiency, uh, useful cycles in lifetime. And it is expected that the share of uh, lithium batteries is also expected to grow in the future as the costs uh, of these uh, batteries are projected to decrease uh, due to the economies of scale, uh, improvements in the production processes, as well as improvements in the storage technology characteristics. Now, apart from installing uh, new battery systems, there also appears to be a good case in reusing uh, batteries from electrical vehicles uh, for building applications. So uh, lithium, lithium batteries are replaced when they reach around 80% uh, of their initial capacity when they're uh, in vehicles. So as, as there is still significant capacity left in these batteries, they can still be used in building applications which are less stressful and have different kind of characteristics of charging and discharging and, en and energy density requirements. So this practice has obvious, uh, has obvious benefits as it can extend the useful lifetime of the batteries and to reduce the waste streams, as well as to potentially provide uh, inexpensive batteries to the market in the future. Um, and this is, you can see the process here, a general diagram of the process of repurposing the batteries. Now, remanufacturing uh, involves, uh, firstly, to remove the batteries from the electric vehicles and conducting a, conducting a quality analysis uh, of the components and data. Um, the sensors, uh, as well as the cooling and housing uh, components may be reused, as well as the battery management systems. And the process is concluded with uh, adjusting the management system for specific applications. Uh, however, the practice of using second life batteries from uh, electrical vehicles um, is not well established yet, and the conditions for successful implementation still need to be defined. So uh, there are potential drawbacks uh, that can uh, hinder their wider implementation. Uh, such drawbacks are the potential competition from new batteries that will have uh, better characteristics and decreased cost in the future. Uh, the cost of, of repurposing the batteries May be, may be quite high and exceed the potential revenues. So that's a potential drawback. As well as uh, another parameter that uh, might lead to hesitation on for the use is the lack of data on their performance on site. So within this context, uh, battery, storage system, battery storage systems have been used in the three Irish lighthouse cities, um, Utrecht, Nice, and Gothenburg. Uh, the battery system were used at the building and district level, both new and second life uh, EV battery systems, uh, as part of the transition track, track to flexible energy management and storage. And these uh, best systems were often demonstrated in combination with vehicle to grid solutions, where electrical uh, Vehicles uh, can also offer storage uh, services through the interaction with the grid and uh, control charging and discharging cycles. So vehicle to grid systems are also expected to increase the storage capacity of the energy systems in the future. And the Iris experience will provide valuable information for the per on the performance of both uh, battery uh, stationary battery systems as well as uh, vehicle to grid systems. Uh, also on the regulatory and business aspects, as well as deployment challenges and lessons learned from the implement implementation process. And these experiences uh, will be shared in the following presentation by uh, relevant partners from the Lighthouse cities of Utrecht, Nice and Gothenburg. Thank you, and I leave the floor to you, Panos.
Panos, are you there? Can you hear me? Ah, okay. So it seems that I'm going to be just taking over uh, as a third presenter. So without introduction from Panos, that is fine, I guess. So let me see if I share this. Yes, and then it seems that you are seeing my presentation. Is that correct? Oh, yes. sorry, I, has, I was muted. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this yes. is yes. <laughs> sorry. Because I made I made the presenter before. Um, so, are you seeing my slide fully, or is go to meeting in the way because it's in the way? No, no, we can see your slide. Um, okay, excellent. But. <laughs> Just a moment to introduce you again. Please. So, Bart van der Rie works uh, with Loboxnet uh, in Utrecht to, uh, and he uh, works on the transition track two solutions. One of these is this battery energy storage uh, system. Yes. So, uh, okay. Thank you, Panos. And uh, <laughs> uh, it's fine. Um, so uh, yes, good afternoon, everybody. Um, um, I am uh, connected to Lomboxnet, uh, which is a SME enterprise in Utrecht. And I suppose most of you know a little about it, but um, I wanted to um, have my presentation in two parts. First, a few slides on um, the concept of Lomboxnet uh, with shared electric vehicle to grid vehicles providing flexibility. And then I would like to move to the uh, stationary battery in Utrecht that is being installed as we speak. Um, and also uh, so that I can um, present a little about the role of this battery in the in the city. Um, so first some slides about uh, what Lomboxnet is doing. Let me see if I can get the next slide. Yes. So um, on the left of this picture, you can see Robin Berg, who is the director of Lomboxnet and who is, um, yeah, uh, really a green innovator that is scaling up fast. Um, this was May last year, and this was the king of the Netherlands. That's the person in the middle visiting. Uh, the opening up of the bi-directional ecosystem that the city of Utrecht is kind of becoming. And uh, to the right, you see the uh, uh, manager of uh, Renault, who is providing the uh, first bi-directional prototype cars uh, that you can see behind the people that were connected uh, to the grid and that are able to actually deliver electricity back into the grid so act as a battery as well um, that story is a long story but it started literally in the backyard of this robin berg this is this backyard it is still more or less like this and this is the very first bi-directional charging station uh, uh, at that time with the chademo uh, protocol in uh, europe uh, so it has developed now into a company that is uh, placing these charging stations, uh, which has developed much further, as you can see in this picture, uh, throughout the city. They have a contract with the city to place uh, several hundred of these charging stations in the city, and all of them are bi-directional. So they are ready for bi-directional charging. And as well, he is um, exploiting a number of shared electric cars uh, that are charged by these charging stations and that um, hopefully in the near future can also be bi-directional. So my role is to support him in this project by, but I work together with uh, Robin in several other projects uh, that, that have developed this. Um, this means that uh, uh, the, there will be a, a large number of these um, uh, charging stations and car in the cities. And that uh, this means that groups of these cars can act as virtual batteries. Um, and that is 
really difficult to do because the cars are not always available and they have to be able to drive maybe um, to this afternoon at five o'clock because somebody booked them. Um, but uh, uh, it is being done right now. And I'm presenting this as introduction because the stationary batteries that are now being placed in the city um, will work together with these cars and will they, they will be able to act as a backup for each other while generating flexibility for the electricity grid. Um, and this is a nice one always to say, uh, so U Utrecht has like um, uh, 300, a little bit over 300,000 people, uh, so like uh, 100,000 or 150,000 households. Um, all of those houses, if you have 8,500 electric cars that could use their batteries to give electricity, 8,500 would be enough to power all the houses in the city for a whole night. Mm. Uh, uh, just to give an idea of the size of the batteries in these cars. Uh, I have an electric car myself and it's, it's incredible the amount of energy that goes into a car. Uh, it can run your house for one to two weeks, depending on your house. Um, so, um, at the moment there are like 130,000 cars in the city, so only part of that needs to be, sorry, needs to be replaced uh, by electric cars and then vehicle to grid, and then you have a energy system that is your city. And this is the ambition of the city in the longer term. Okay. Um, the first market for that technology will be new housing developments. This is a, a development that is uh, uh, going to be built in the next few years in, in Utrecht. It's a zero energy district. Uh, it's a little bit north of uh, where we are with Aarhus. Um, so a lot of solar energy on the houses and solar energy on this um, uh, sound barrier here. And uh, uh, almost no parking places in this district. So a nice, nice beautiful need for um, shared electric vehicles uh, that could also uh, stabilize that electricity production. Okay, so this is all introduction. Uh, Utrecht becoming a, a network and a city-wide city -wide network of, of public charges and really getting a unique position. Okay, so where is Iris in this picture? This is the Iris um, uh, area. So the colored buildings are actually involved in the Iris project. Most of them are social housing buildings. And somewhere here, the uh, stationary battery will be placed. Um, First, some more pictures of, this is also Iris, the, the cars that are, are in Iris, being opened by Elderman and charging stations. Okay, and then moving on to the, to the battery. Okay, actually, um, it has been quite a process. So, um, uh, why is the battery not working yet? Well, because it took some trouble and it also was, well, very, um, uh, uh, interesting to learn some lessons on the way, and I would like to share that with you. So, initially, we had the ambition to also use um, second life batteries in Utrecht, like Basilis uh, presented. Uh, using second life batteries has a, uh, a number of advantages, uh, being circular, extending life, and, and so on. So, um, the partners put out a tender to battery uh, producers and, uh, and companies. Okay, can we please have a number of second life batteries installed in the garage boxes, which are on the other underside of these buildings, connected to the buildings and uh, yes, can we have that? Um, the, well, the tailor didn't go as planned. Let me say it like this. Uh, uh, actually, we did not get good uh, offers. What we got was a lot of concerns about 
fire safety issues, which I think are uh, in place. Uh, uh, so if you put a battery, a second life battery, even more, maybe, maybe more dangerous, but the, the thing is we don't know. If you put something we don't know in the cellar of a building where people live, um, well, uh, there is uh, not much or not enough known about the fire risk of, of the batteries. So the parties delivering these batteries said, well, it's really hard to do. And also from the municipality and the region, there came um, concerns about this. Uh, a very stupid practical thing is that these carriers boxes are not really very high and the batteries were very high, so physically high. So they were too tall for the garage boxes to fit in well, which is not good. Um, the third one was that the prices we got offered were really high. Um, so it was kind of amazing. The prices of the secondhand batteries as we were offered were significantly higher than the prices of new stationary batteries with the same capacity. So what's going on? Well, actually, uh, I don't know for sure, but what I think is uh, the amount of secondhand or sorry, second life batteries um, on the market for this type of uh, application is really limited still. We don't have so many electric cars yet and they are new. And so the complete flow of batteries from cars to this uh, application has yet to start. This is future. And it might also be that, but this is a suspicion of mine, that uh, beautiful um, subsidized projects like this create a kind of an artificial demand temporarily for second life batteries. Uh, but this was never told to me. This is a personal uh, conviction. But the end is that that uh, it really was not uh, working well. We we would have very small batteries for, for a very high price and they wouldn't fit well in the building and we would have a lot of trouble with fire safety. So in the end, it was decided to switch to new batteries and also to put them outside the buildings uh, to make one central battery energy system uh, uh, between the buildings and have a tender for that. Well, that tender uh, gave resulted in offers that were uh, much more competitive, like think about a factor of 1.5 to 2 more kilowatt hours per euro, let's say, than second life batteries. And we selected in the team uh, Tesla power pack to be installed. And I will have some one or two pictures about that later uh, in the next slides, but uh, let me say they, the Tesla power packs have been delivered right now. They are waiting to be installed and to be connected. Um, and after connection, we will, of course, uh, exploit them and also um, engage, uh, uh, do actions to engage uh, citizens and and the city uh, with with press and and well we have some nice ideas about that. But still, we first have to install that. So this picture is what's actually actually there now. Uh, they're on the street and uh, they have been delivered by Tesla and they need to be installed now. So we're talking about Tesla power pack battery uh, capacity 845 kilowatt hours power uh, 590 kilowatts um, it will be interconnected to a pv system uh, so that direct pv charging can be um, stored and uh, also this is to, to generate research data for scaling up um, it will be interconnected to the vehicle to grid electric car sharing system that I presented before. Um, okay, and it will have uh, uh, smart inverters uh, guarantee. It will be uh, compliant to several protocols um, and it will 
and it will be out will be installed outside in a uh, green area between the housing buildings. How will it be used and exploited? So the uh, housing association, uh, Boex, has bought it, will be the owner, will stay the owner, but the technical and financial exploitation will be delegated to Lomboxnet. Um, an agreement for that is, uh, uh, well, it has yet to be signed, but it's, it's, uh, it's almost there. Um, and what the battery will do, um, it will be, uh, trade uh, on the balance markets of the TSO, um, the primary reserve and the frequency response markets. Um, the uh, actual business result of that trading is hard to forecast at this moment because uh, these markets are in the Netherlands really uh, in a lot of movement, I would say. So this year, they uh, they have been more um, profitable than last year, but the year before they were more profitable than. So the business case of this will be mm, uncertain. Um, they will be used to store the power from that PV system and to feed it into the grid in a more regulated way. Together with this, um, uh, they will be connected to the uh, grid balancing uh, system that also contains the electric vehicles so that we uh, can provide local flexibility uh, in the Iris district. Um, unfortunately, in, in the Netherlands, there is no business case yet for uh, doing that. DSOs uh, are not uh, uh, at this moment in a position to, to give any um, financial incentive to provide flexibility, but this is uh, kind of a physical and, uh, experiment and a market experiment that we can do with these uh, batteries. Uh, and it will be uh, generated, it will be generating uh, technical monitoring data and we will also, um, uh, well, let's say play with it uh, so that we can generate research data for, for upscaling. Okay, as I said, the exploitation results are uncertain. Um, uh, we think we can expect uh, for this battery to have a positive uh, exploitation result. And if it is there, then it will be used for the benefit of the tenants, who uh, especially this year can, can use a little money and or public, public space improvement. So the, uh, in fact, the housing association is not allowed to add a positive result to its own balance. Um, okay, uh, the whole thing will be uh, subject to quite some constraints. For instance, the uh, exploitation is not optimal because this battery will suffer from this double energy taxation thing that is uh, in place in more European countries, uh, as I am aware. As I said, the DSO uh, is not allowed to create a flexibility market yet, although they are working on it. So hopefully in future, they will be able to actually uh, share the money they will save from the flexibility with people delivering the flexibility. Um, okay, and, and so, but, but we will try to run it and these issues have been brought to the attention of the European Commission uh, already a while ago. Uh, among several initiatives in this innovation deal on electric vehicles. Okay, these pictures are from a different battery that is, uh, I think, less than two kilometers away in the same city. Uh, this is what it will more or less look like because this is also a Tesla power pack. It's uh, situated at the trade fair area, Jaarbeurs, some of you I know have visited it. Um, and the nice thing is that uh, we will be able to, to uh, team up these batteries when it is necessary or when it is useful to, uh, uh, to work in the same energy system together with these cars and other flexibility measures. 
So this battery is kind of the future of the iris battery, but it will also be a, a brother battery working together sometimes. Well, that's uh, reaching the end of my presentation. Um, so to summarize, we are installing our battery right now. We have learned interesting lessons uh, about uh, uh, tendering for batteries uh, that I have shared. Um, financial results can only be uh, obtained at this moment on the TSO uh, balance markets, uh, but we can provide other services on, on the local level and, and uh, turn this district into a smarter district with the battery. And at the same time, uh, we hope to continue to get important practical experience and um, research results uh, while we are trying to, to see uh, how it actually will work for financially and also for the tenants and the public space. Well, that was my presentation. Um, final slide just to show that this, this involves a lot of parties. <laughs> So. Yeah. Thank you very much. We'll come back later with questions <laughs> regarding this demonstration. That's okay. And our next presenter is Christian Kame from EDF. Christian will present uh, the demonstrations in Nice, Côte d'Azur, in particular in two buildings. The Emirate building of, uh, the nice, of the Nice Côte d'Azur University and the Palacio Meridia building uh, of Next City. These buildings are close together and both have, uh, they have uh, installed uh, battery energy storage systems. Yes, hello. You hear me? Hello. Yes, just a moment to make your presenter. Ah. Okay. Um, so. I have problem with my camera because I'm from the iPad, so I'm not sure it should work. But I try to share my screen. This should work, I hope. Um, yes, you see it now? Yes. Yeah. Perfect. But so, well, uh, Christian Kain from EDF. Okay. Not yet. Yeah, it's because we, I have a bad see. connection. Okay. Uh, it's, it's okay. It's good. Yes, perfect. So well, so thank you. So Christian Kain from EDF, um, located in Marseille, south of France, and we prepared this uh, presentation together with uh, Ron, um, Honora Kina from uh, IMRED, so from the Université Nisco d'Azur, uh, which treated me with a lot of information, and I tried to condense into this presentation. So the let's say the uh, the light motive behind this uh, this presentation for me was to give, give you a little bit of feedback or let's say lessons learned from the process we have lived in the last years and well try to share uh, important things which i think should be put on the table and so to avoid anybody who retries to do the same thing to do it better than we have done um i think it's it's the it's the aim of this innovation project is to to leave this pro this process uh live with all the obstacles we live and well and share it to to enable others to not do mistakes again so uh well we have a few uh regs it's not the latin for for the king it's just a, a very french jargon we use for return of experience so we give you a turn of experience of the design procurement and delivery phases we have lived until now uh so we didn't uh, go into operation yet so we will have to do that another time so just a small reminder i think you know this picture so we have uh just to resettle the two uh buildings we are talking about we have on the left side the next city building uh it's the biggest wooden frame building in france uh which already completed and uh totally sold and inhabited uh there we have a, a pv system uh, about 90 kilowatt peak which is connected to an 80 kilowatt uh, battery system energy storage system and which will be integrated in a what we formally call uh, common self-consumption so and the, the meaning behind is that we have one producer so the pv system which can dispatch to many users so more than one in this case two uh, users uh, the energy consumption 
And so it's regulated how uh, the transaction, let's say the cost of the PV and also the energy are uh, split between these two customers, let's call them. Uh, on the other side, we have the inbred building, which is the university building, um, which is also delivered and students are ready. <laughs> using it as they should uh, in this um, in this caller year so in this case we have an individual self-consumption so this uh, 180 kilowatt peak uh, pv system feeds directly into the building so it's the only let's say consumer behind uh, there we have a quite a complex uh, system because we have about uh, we have one uh, first life battery uh, system with 100 kilowatt peak uh, 100 kilowatt sorry and 150 kilowatt hour and we also have uh, two battery stacks uh, of 36 kilowatts each from Second Life uh, battery. So they're coming from uh, Renault. Uh, and so these are two battery stacks we have also in the building, which also will be used. And we also have like uh, Utrecht uh, one, was just one uh, prototype of the um, Renault Zoe uh, direct current, uh, no, other direct current uh, V2G. Uh, prototype in the building um, so that I think we could for the next time use uh, this type of Im 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 image uh, so you see buildings are good and running and delivered and they're much nicer than the 3d rendering and just so let's move forward do you see the slide um, with the written content just to ensure yes. that we are on the same page yes. great thanks <laughs> So uh, I think one point to rise is that actually we have a really a non-coincidence between the starting and let's say the lifetime of a real estate project and our H2020 project. So uh, it's nothing bad, just as a matter of fact, uh, real estate had to start earlier and so we came into the game later. So actually the whole action we had to perform was kind of running against the clock and also the decision making process to ensure that we get everything settled in time and ensure everything then will be taken and integrated into the construction process um, so the whole process has been lived as a totally as a, a posterior modification of all technical elements you live in a construction life cycle let's say uh, so we had to revise or connected related to the storage system technical and functional specifications uh, we had to update uh, multiple times plan and drawing schemes and also there were a lot of discussions about who should do what and who is responsible for what uh, so this really needed also to to run up and down all scales of decision making not just in our own companies but also in third-party companies and ensure they're all aligned and we get at some point all on the same page and get the things done um, we also try to really be proactive uh, feed information up front uh, tell them already what they should foresee in months of forecast and um, ahead but all this wasn't really helpful because um, companies just work as they used to work and they want to know things when they think they need it so this was not really uh, something that was let's say uh, uh, efficient uh, also what we have to live with was that in this process as you uh, this process we also have to live with suboptimal solution so there were decisions taken on systems on measurement or activation system or on the ict part and well they couldn't be undone or just modified we had to be integrated into that and so we didn't get to the point but they would have would like for certain let's say details and but what we can say is that basically what has uh, enabled all this was really a strong engagement of the owners so from next city on one side and in red building on the other side and I would say they also applied a little bit different strategies to make the things happen so uh, in red uh, they're really owner and master of the building so they really internalized a lot of activities so they they, they took on on their own shoulders uh, quite a lot of works uh, next city is a totally different type of actor so it's really a state developer so he chose the externalization but he put in place a really nice collaborative approach where we ensured uh, we can meet all together we discuss everything together and so that we have all the same informations um, Generally speaking, okay, we have engaged in a battery uh, in a battery system. Um, 
but uh, what uh, why are we using it what's how do we size it what 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 is the objective of this uh, system why are we using it so um, what I could say is that actually, generally speaking, I would say in the French context at least, uh, we cannot base our sizing or, or the choice of a system purely economical or business model related aspects. Uh, it's mostly environmental ones or about image or about labeling of a building because by any mean, uh, we did a lot of calculations, uh, by any mean there is no uh, no setup in an urban environment and also in a new built environment as we experience in Nice, um, uh, let's say a monetary argument to uh, in favor of this system. Um, in any case, we have uh, um, uh, we have we have to uh, it enlarge the return of ex of investment on the over PV system, let's say of at least three years. And then you go up to infinity, uh, the bigger you scale your battery system until you get to really, um, um, let's say, not acceptable numbers of 20 to 50 year uh, return of investment. And you have to calculate that your battery has, uh, let's say, a lifetime which is um, insured by a constructor of 10 years to 15 years. Um, so we have to live with that. And so we should look for uh, actors which really have uh, something more than just uh, money in mind to push this type of project. And let's say from a personal point of view, this will not change in the short term. Uh, but what is really interesting is to uh, first understand what are the use cases which have a potential in the short to midterm uh, in this urban environment. So in tertiary or housing uh, cases, so not industrial uh, sector, which is a totally different type of approach. I think it's really interesting to look for. And also what's interesting to mention is that we have used two totally different approaches between uh, the next city in Imran building for sizing these batteries. So in one we used, uh, it's not negative just because no one is better than the other. Um, I, let's say traditional approach, so based on volume, capacities, uh, looking for the load curve, uh, load duration curve, and identify what should be uh, an optimum. And then we used another approach, which were more a little bit more experimental, which really gone into operational scenarios. Uh, so with really uh, load curve simulations and operating the system as it should operate in real conditions and try to identify um, hints to how to uh, better size the system. Um, next uh, maybe one one more point on maybe on uh, on this point uh, because of this non um, let's say uh, profitability of this system there may be two things to be to be noticed uh, to be said uh, why in the french context it's not available it's, it's not feasible it's because the current um, uh, the current tarification system for electricity uh, is uh, it's not uh, it's not favoring battery energy storage system or other, or other type let's say of uh, economies in the subscribed power or on the sizing of the system because the terrification is mostly focusing on the volume of energy you consume and it's not penalizing anybody on the amount of energy uh, the subscribed energy has on the network so you don't have any let's say uh, enough revenues to make peak load shifting uh, peak shaving or peak shifting and downsize your system and in this regards there is no engineering company today that takes the risk to downsize your system based on let's say the, um, the capacity uh, of a battery so we still have oversight system from the electrical part and in this system you have to fit into your battery energy storage system which uh, well doesn't make it uh, really makeable from a financial point of view. Then uh, what I think we also did in general was a little bit an error in the budget. So um, it's not rocket science to uh, to uh, size the system, but you have to understand that the battery is treated like a rocket. And to really run the system, understand what you should prepare for, you need quite a lot of knowledge talking about science, or at least you have really have to have insiders which really know what they're talking about. Um, we tried first to lean on regulation, but regulation on battery storage systems um, in uh, the build environment is really too broad yet. So they don't give you any hint about what you should do and what you should look for. 
uh, it's really it's a really bit disappointing let's say if you're trying to search answers there what you have to search for is really insiders which have handled experience which have lived this system and which can give you a return of experience and really tell you what it's all about and in this case it was the Estoran forecast which played this game uh, this role uh, so they were in the first they have been they have explain to each and everybody all the issues um, uh, associated with the system in the in a building and you will see it's um it's not easy because first of all these are quite big systems so it's uh, you need to that you have a space for that and space in also in a 5000 square meter building uh, if it's already launched architect plans have been done uh, all has been settled from a functional point of view find now uh, square meters for integrating the system is very very difficult and so you end up putting it that really in the last uh, corners you've got uh, free space in your building which is really complicated then then i said you should treat it as a rocket uh, because it's an explosive asset so you have very stringent fire safety measure as our colleague already mentioned and the uh, problem is um, as said, regulation doesn't give you a hint about. Uh, if you call to the local fire department, you might not even aware about it. So really get to companies that know about it and they will understand, explain you what has to be done. And what is really interesting is that you also have a, a Tesla part in your garage on the side. Well, they don't have to satisfy all this measure, but your stationary system, yes. So well, and then once you have your battery, uh, it's a really special technology. So uh, you really have also to be prepared to go a step further in your, let's say, operation management system, and also the whole ICT architecture you have. So you sh there are uh, there are much more, uh, let's say, higher standards that have to be uh, that are required, and which have to be understood on the client side and also from the other third parties involved. Um, so let's move forward. So while talking about space, uh, this is a, um, a part of the plan of the uh, of the parking uh, of the next city building. So I said space requirement gets really complicated. Uh, and if you're talking about also with a real estate developer, you have to let him understand that this battery, which might might not sound big, well, it's pretty heavy. It's one ton and it's also pretty voluminous so once you search your less space in the garage you also have to ensure that you get your batteries through because uh, they have to fit in uh, all the openings and be put in place where they have to be in this case there was found a small place uh, near the substation level so a connection from the car part um, it was really uh, let's say optimized however there was no space for all the rest of the equipment which was needed for the control room so well you have to have your cables run around the whole uh, garage floor and connect these different pieces of the system and well just a little note uh, if this already seems a little bit voluminous and heavy if you want the same capacity of second life batteries uh, you should calculate and double the numbers because you have, let's say, half the capacity, more or less, uh, roughly speaking, uh, less the capacity with same volume, um, with the same volume. So you need to double the weight. You have to double the volume to get the same capacities. Um, and then really a big issue was the fire safety has already been mentioned. So we have our rockets in our garage. So what do we do? What do we have to do um, to, to, to make it sure and make it acceptable and have uh, the building running safely? So uh, Honora is gone and has searched for all the builds and costs they have uh, engaged in. And so well, for building this building, you have to at least so look for about 10,000 euros for all the masonry for the walls, and uh, let's say for the space, for the securitization of the space. You have to have fire door. You have to have um, fire all the fire ventilation system concerning climatization, but also uh, fire safety has to be uh, redundant and specific to the um, to the uh, to the battery room. So you see all the list of different appliances we have to put in place which gives you about a budget of 50,000 euros, which haven't been foreseen. And in neither of the cases, neither in Red nor Next City, they were prepared for this type of cost. So then once you have your battery, if you want for, uh, for the sourcing of your battery, well, you can have two 
big uh, two big models. One is off the track, so the company manufacturer leaves you the battery on your space or in front of a building and it's up to you or your engineering companies uh, construction companies to bring this battery down connect it and put it into service or you can ask them for a turnkey solution so they will engage for everything and uh, ensure uh, the battery is well up and running commissioned as it should um, the problem is that battery i mean um, battery manufacturers the business is the product not the service so they charge a little bit higher, let's say, than usual engineer would you expect from usual engineering companies uh, for making, let's say, going from the off the track to the turnkey solution. So you could uh, just have um, use good choice. That you could choose the cheapest solution, so the off the track one. But then you should really be prepared to have a lot of surprises and then you will be almost always, uh, if this company is not used to and has not experienced with type of system, you always have get back to your uh, battery manufacturer and ask him for support, which well doesn't comes, uh, which comes with a price. So well, this should be taken in mind um, if, if this type of uh, system is engaged. And well, and the devil is in the details. That's why you always have to get back to your <laughs> So your battery manufacturer. So in this case, we have a picture about the uh, room uh, where the battery system is located, which you see on the right side, and you have on the left side symbol. So I give you just a few details, really specific things uh, which we had to experience. So in the first case is that the whole system should look totally different and be, if you usually look in manufacturer detail sheets, uh, you will see they're all were well packed, racked one in the, against the other. But well, if you have space problems, you have to be a little bit creative and they had the chance to have the possibility to work hand in hand with the uh, electricians to reassemble the whole system into the room, let's say, in another way, which could fit more or less properly. Um, what you don't see in the right corner up there is that actually have the climatization system uh, for the batteries, which is properly, uh, properly set on top of uh, the entrance. However, the problem is that the uh, the ventilation direction of this climatization creates an unacceptable, let's say, airflow on the battery rack. Why? Because on the whole racks, you have sensors which ensure that you have a homogeneous temperature am among uh, all the cells. And if you pass a, a 10 degree uh, delta T, well, the battery goes automatically in security mode and you're not able more to use them and you have to get back and uh, re-adjust uh, uh, this issue. And also what's really important why they have this type of uh, sensors inside, embedded inside the batteries, because temperature uh, influences the aging of the different cells. And actually you would like that your cells, uh, let's say, age in the most homogeneous way possible uh, on the whole rack. And well, so just a small adjustment of uh, the direction of the flow avoided all these errors in the battery and can ensure them that they work properly. And then if you're talking about space problems and you are in the underground, well, you should also maybe consider that you may be in a flood, and, um, a flood risk zone. And so you should ensure that you still have enough space on top to be able to elevate this, uh, your battery racks in order to avoid to a certain degree to come uh, to, to, to be able to hedge against a, a flood which might happen or not uh, in the building. So, and then the battery might also sometimes a little bit underestimated in the sense you think that one is connected, everything will work. Well, it's not a plug and play system. Uh, it really has to follow procedures. Uh, how do you put uh, your commission and put into service the battery? And here we have uh, the protocol, which is um, followed by the manufacturer. So you really have to be able to, because the battery comes just uh, charged at 25% level. And then you have to let it cycle. So discharge your battery, fully charge your battery, re-discharge it fully, and then recharge at half. And this is a big issue if your building is new, because it might be that your load is too low uh, to able to absorb your battery uh, power. So you have to have the okay from the, from the distribution system operator to perform this type of action. And so discharge surplus capacity on the grid. Uh, and this needs uh, extra contactual arrangements. 
which is not a costly issue, but well, a, quest, a question of time. So in the case of the Emirate building, we have about, you have seen a 100 uh, kilowatt power, but the building today uh, has just a 30 kilowatt uh, load. So you still have quite of a surplus to inject for a few hours uh, in a day uh, on the on the grid. And well, if you are, if you have the possibility, also use a resistive bench huh, to dissipate the power from the battery, but well, it will heat up your room quite a lot. So um, then when you want to go into the operation, you have to think about uh, how you operate this building, uh, this, uh, this system, and how it fits into the overall uh, management system of the building for all the facilities, all technical facilities. So uh, there is no standard for that. Uh, you will be, be faced with case-by-case uh, -case, uh, solutions. And you will see that depending on the choices that uh, the operator has done, uh, you operate in silos. So you have to try to connect silos together, which might not be meant to be communicating together. And you have to build up on the uh, software side, APIs, uh, which are pretty costly uh, to be able to interface the system. But you also might need to, uh, depending on how open systems are on the physical part, also on the mason system, you should build bit bridges uh, among uh, metering or um, control devices or switches, uh, maybe bypass them or double them, uh, depending on your needs. So you should also be prepared to work on that. And an issue on that is, uh, even though, as I said before, you might provide uh, the concerned parties with information upfront, these are things that are discussed very late in the project. And it's usually very late in the project where costs are already overdone. Uh, people are in stress in a hurry, uh, delays are accumulating. So it's difficult to get things through uh, on this level. So um, just a small uh, well, uh, advice is that we still today, it's just a matter of fact, it's not, a, let's say, a, a pejorative word. Today we live in a world where smart looks more like a spaghetti word. Spared spaghetti word just means you have to build up so many connections as services. So you don't have, let's say, uh, an operating system which enables to interface all the system and dispatch the data and information and, uh, let's say, the controls uh, just where it is needed. Um, so. Uh, what we would put forward is that once it's possible and really the system gets really into something could be a smart building to look for solutions uh, which are going the direction of the nowadays i think uh, emerging market of the building operating system uh, which enable uh, let's say to avoid the spaghetti where on the whole life cycle of the building and ensure that uh, you have quite a, a gains in uh, questions of architecture, simplicity, and also more, of, more, uh, more importantly of costs. Because the big issue is in the spaghetti where when you build it up, uh, you can build it up and you can work properly. But the problem is when it has been settled, it's difficult to find somebody after a few years of operation which is uh, prepared uh, to rechange, recode, uh, readapt uh, all the system. And it becomes quite of a really complicated and costly operation. Whereas with a building operating system, it's sought to be uh, an evolutive system, an open system, an evolutive system, in which you can plug uh, entry, retreat, uh, services, uh, let's say on demand. Uh, which form less, uh, which far less a cost. So, well, uh, where we are today, um, we have all the systems in the photos on the both buildings. They are all individually commissioned. So, just today, we have actually next to the building, uh, the battery is cycled, uh, as you have explained before, in the charges charging cycle for um, for the for the commission of the battery. Uh, also, the energy management system, the SCADA system, are all in place. Um, we are missing to uh, test the overall uh, connection on the whole system uh, because we are still missing um, the main metering block, uh, metering system on, on the load side of the buildings, which are needed to have the uh, load forecast. So um, we think that we will be able to start everything in January. Uh, and be able to go live with our energy management system and the whole battery system and then also uh, start with interfacing it with the CIP which is under development. So thanks a lot. I hope I was not too long. So, Thank you Christian uh, for this 
shared lessons and your detailed presentation. Thank you very much. And our next uh, presentation, the third uh, lighthouse city, Gothenburg. And the first presentation is from Housing Association Viva. And uh, it's a joint presentation by Elena Nordstrom from Goth Gothenburg Energy, Pierre Hult from Rick Spigen, and Ilva Olafsson from Volvo Group Trucks. And uh, I pass the floor to Pierre. Yes. Um, first of all, can you hear me well? Yes. Or... Okay, good. Good. Uh, okay. Um, I'll try to share my screen then. Um, wait. Mm. Um. Okay. So you we can see your screen, but not the presentation yet. Okay. Can you see it now? Yes. Uh, wait. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Um, maybe I should do a, a quick introduction. Um, my name is yeah, as we said, um, uh, I have a master in mechanics and sustainable energy systems. Uh, I've been working at this uh, building and uh, property management company, Riksbyggen, uh, for about two and a half years now uh, with energy systems. And I've been involved in IRIS with uh, the research and energy monitoring of Viva for the past uh, two years, more or less. Um, so that's a little bit about me. Um, and in the picture that you can see right now, um, you're seeing the Housing Association Viva. Uh, and this uh, pro property have a battery installed, obviously. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. Um, the battery storage is uh, connected to uh, the solar cells that you can see here on the picture. Uh, oh, it doesn't seem like my, no, here on the roofs of the three tall buildings and on the roof of the one of the small buildings, we have solar cells. Um, and the battery storage uh, is, is also connected to a, um, in the context, uh, advanced control uh, system. Uh, we move on. Um, let's see, it works. Yes. Uh, the batteries, uh, they are lent by Volvo and uh, comes from the bus line 55, uh, who has traveled around the Gothenburg city for about five years before the batteries uh, been taken out. Um, the batteries are removed from the electrical buses when they have about 80% capacity left. Uh, the reason for picking, picking them out at 80% uh, is that you want to co be uh, completely sure that the buses go from start to end stop. And uh, within a few years, uh, Volvo will uh, most likely have many electric buses in operation and will thus have uh, a lot of batteries that eventually needs to be replaced. Uh, so this, uh, this is an attempt to extend the life of the batteries, giving them a second life. Um, at the Housing Association Viva uh, before being recycled. Um, as, said, as being said earlier, uh, the batteries can still be used uh, in uh, building applications uh, that are less stressful and have different characteristics. Uh, a total of uh, 14 uh, lithium iron phosphate batteries uh, with a capacity of 200 kilowatt hours are installed. Um, 
this is a battery type with a very low cobalt content. Um, the equipment in the room is adapted to not only fit the bus batteries, but uh, to also be able to fit other battery types if uh, needed in the future. Um, the project will run for about five years. Uh, or it will run for five years. It's about three years uh, left now. Um, and the main purpose is to develop a concept for storing electricity in apartment buildings with used bus batteries and with an associated business model. Uh, the batteries will be re recycled after use in Viva at the end of 2023. Uh, Volvo is responsible for the batteries being taken care of after the end of the project. Um, if the batteries can still be used, uh, they might be left uh, in BRF Viva. Um, the, the Volvo has a supply responsibility here. Um, so we don't know yet uh, if they will be, uh, what will happen to them. Um, but that is yet to be seen. Uh, we move on. We, we move on. Um, uh, as, uh, as I've just said, the direct purpose uh, is to develop a concept for storing electricity in apartment buildings with used bus batteries. But uh, put in a more in a larger perspective, it's also about creating a better, better understanding for how how housing and energy systems can work together. Uh, to contribute to more resource efficient use of batteries in houses and vehicles, um, provide increased opportunities to produce more renewable electricity in Sweden, solar and wind, uh, to contribute to increased collaboration between the city, academia and business, and also to spread knowledge about sustainable living and uh, the energy systems of the future uh, that we are doing right now. Uh, I move on, I move on. Uh, okay, and now to the battery storage location. Um, so, what you're seeing here is um, uh, uh, some sort of cross-section from of the project. Um, and the numbering is, um, is then uh, the residential addresses. Uh, and you see a cross section from east to west. Uh, and the battery room is uh, right here. Uh, and as you can see, there are no buildings nor uh, any apartments or any structures above the battery room. And that is uh, very good in terms of fire safety. And if I go back to the first slide really fast, I can show you where it is. So uh, you were seeing the cross section from this uh, view, from this way. So the battery storage is uh, right uh, here. Um, yes. uh, okay, and a little bit about the security. Uh, the batteries, uh, they have a room of their own, a battery room. Uh, and this uh, battery room has its own cooling and ventilation and alarm system. Um, the operation and maintenance uh, is handled by uh, Gothenburg Energy. Um, and the alarms goes to Riksbyggen Service Center firsthand, who, ten who then calls Gothenburg Energy uh, for further handling. Um, during a normal operation, no dangerous gases are expected to be formed, uh, but in the event of a fault, the temperature can rise and dangerous gases can be formed. Um, and to ensure the right temperature, uh, ventilation and cooling systems are crucial for safety. Uh, doors and walls meet fire protection class EI60. Uh, the batteries themselves are not classified as flammable or explosive. Uh, the batteries have a voltage of about 700 volts, so it requires 
specific qualified people to be handled. Uh, safety comes first and the safety requirements are high for both vehicles, batteries and also high for this battery energy st storage system. Uh, yeah, and now to the system description. Um, as being said in the beginning, the battery storage is uh, connected to solar cells um, and to a central node um, uh, called the energy hub. Uh, this um, energy hub acts as an uh, inverter converting uh, AC to DC and vice versa. Um, so this is the, the brain in the system. Uh, the energy hub also collects data uh, to optimize the energy flow between the solar panels, the energy storage and the grid uh, using advanced algorithms. Um, I move on. Um, and uh, sp speaking of uh, optimizing energy flows, um, Gothenburg Energy together with RISE are responsible for uh, the development of a smart overall control system uh, to control the energy flows uh, within Viva. An even smarter control system that is in operation than the one that is in operation right now. Uh, uh, yeah, and um, to give you some examples of how that control can be done. Um, the battery storage is uh, um, the first and foremost charged by cell-produced solar electricity. Uh, it can be charged by the electricity grid. Uh, the batteries would, uh, if they would be full, the energy would go directly to the property and residents' electricity need. Um, and if the electric electricity demand is saturated, then the battery storage and the battery storage is fully short, then the solar power supply uh, would be sold out to the electricity grid. Um, solar electricity and electricity from the grid and from the batteries can also be used to power the heat pumps for preparation of hot water and for space heating. Um, the hot water can be stored in accumulator tanks um, to be used for space heating or hot tap water preparation later. Uh, all in all, you can say that the batteries can be used to produce just about anything uh, in the energy system. Uh, so they play a key role here. Um, so the expected benefits from the battery storage is that um, we expect uh, the peak power to be uh, decreased by 40 kilowatts, so about 20-25%. Um, the, the solar electricity is reduced by, by 16% from 20 to all to 4%. Um, and we also reduces the load on the electricity grid. And, and this is, uh, this has been told earlier, this is a way to utilize, utilize uh, resources longer. We give the buses a second, the bus batteries a second life before being recycled. Um, and worth mentioning is also uh, that the battery storage, uh, the system, the room, the batteries, everything at Viva is more of a state-of-the-art solution, and this and it's, it would be it it would most likely not be uh, economically just just uh, justifiable to replicate it completely. Um, yes, current operation. Uh, while we're waiting for this super master control system, this uh, the energy management system that um, RISE and Gothenburg Energy is working with, um, uh, while we're waiting for that to be implemented and activated, we uh, continuously set charge and discharge uh, levels manually. 
uh, and the, the system is now set to a peak uh, shaving mode uh, where the batteries are used to cut the peak power consumption. Uh, and this is an example um, from the batteries in operation from July, uh, summer operation, where we can see uh, um, that the batteries actually are cutting uh, peak power. So um, the blue line uh, represents the electricity consumption. Uh, the black line is the bought electricity from the grid. The green line is the, the power from the batteries. So when it goes below zero, it uh, recharges. And uh, when it goes above zero, then it's, it's, it dis discharges. Uh, and the yellow line, uh, that, that would be the solar production. Uh, and this expected it's, it's high during the day. So here, it's quite clear that uh, battery storage, storage uh, reduces both power. Uh, that would be the difference between the blue and gray lines. Uh, you can also see that when, when the, the gray field, um, um, the, the, when the battery, um, during the day when, when there, there is too much solar production, the, the, some electricity is being sold out on the, on the grid. Um, and if we compare to, to uh, uh, a month in, in, the, in the winter, it's, uh, it's uh, quite clear that there are much less solar radiation. Um, and, but still we can, uh, we can cut some, some uh, uh, shave some, some peak power. Um, but um, not in, in the same, um, how do you say like um, in the way, same way as in, in the summer? Um, so there's clear clear difference. Um, yes, we move on. Uh, key performance indicators might not be very interesting. Uh, problems. I guess this one, this slide is is um, interesting. Uh, we've had some. Uh, problems uh, with the fire safety regulation. They are not up to date uh, for systems with the uh, reuse of bus batteries. Um, we, um, uh, yeah, the, the integration between the batteries from Volvo uh, with, together with the Viva's uh, control system there's been some problems with that integration um, and uh, the, the, the alarm management and ongoing operation control. Um, we have had some problems with coordination between actors and distribution of responsibilities. Uh, there's been many, many interfaces to work with. Uh, but in all, it's, it, it's, it has worked uh, quite, quite well, actually, I have to say. Um, and lessons learned um, have a maintenance charging strategy um, in uh, so, so that the, the, the batteries don't run out of charge. Um, um, yeah, important with uh, continuous operation monitoring um, and to act faster on alarms. Uh, and maybe uh, have a compatible software in the batteries, uh, control software in the batteries from the beginning uh, when you when you install them in, in the in the houses, and then you wouldn't have all these problems with the integration that we've had. Uh, Yes, um, that was uh, it. Uh, if you if you have any uh, yeah question or thoughts, you are free to email me, or, and I can forward it to to the right right person. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. And uh, our last presentation is from Akademska Hughes, Per yeah. Lovert, and uh, Jonas Hanson. Uh, 
we shared experiences from the working lab uh, building uh, in Gothenburg. Just a moment there to make a presenter. Yeah. Okay. Share your screen. Do you see my screen? Not yet. No. Is it there? No. Sorry. Screen, stop sharing your screen now. No, I can, I see my screen, but you don't do it. No. Do you want to, sh to share my screen or do you want to make Jonas presenter? Yeah, maybe Jonas, can you be better than me? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Uh... I can also uh, share the, my screen because I have your presentation. Yeah, can you do that and I can present yeah. that later? Just a moment. So, No problem. No. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Okay. Are you, I am. Can, can I control it or? Mm, I don't know. Uh, maybe. Uh, let me. Otherwise, I can say to you to change picture. It may be easier. You can change okay. the picture for me, yeah? Okay, yeah. Yeah, uh, Yes. then we start. My name is Per Lövrid and uh, my colleague Jonas Hansson will share you some uh, information about our pilot project. Uh, take the next picture. Uh, we have two pilot projects in Iris project and they are located at Chalmers University testbed uh, demo site. And uh, there we have two things that we do for IRIS project. It's, it is a battery system that we are talking about here, and we have also a PCM cooling storage systems. And you can see there in, in the right corner of the picture. So it's a lot of things we have here at Chalmers test site, but Today we will present also only the storage of electricity and cooling. The next picture. The working lab is the building where we have the storage, battery storage and the PCM storage. It's a rather new building that we have built in Chalmers University campus area. And it's a little bit of innovation strategy in this building so we put in new things that we want to develop and do a good per performance with as you can see it's a normal building uh, in site and 12,400 square meters rather nice building we think you can take the next slide I will repeat a little about what we are doing about this storage. Why do we do it? It's very simple, but sometimes it's good to go back and uh, think about why are we doing this? For why, what purpose? As you know, in the future, energy productions will be more one wind power. It is all, we are already there. Solar power, solar heating, solar productions. 
and the production will be controlled by more of the forces of the weather, as you know. It will not be possible to control the production based on demand so much. If it's possible to produce, then you should produce your energy, of course. What happens when uh, we can't produce it then? That's the problem. We must store it somewhere, maybe. Traditional electric production through hydropower, nuclear energy or district heating can continuously provide electricity, heating and cooling. And it's controlled based on the need, as you know. Fuel is supplied through fuel water storage. So there is the storage. But when we use the fuel energy production, we must fix some storage for the energy, as you know. The cost of this variation in production ends up with the property owners. We believe, Academies Kehusen, that we are working for, also know that increased power charges lie ahead. We now need to do something about this issue together with the power providers. Therefore, we are interested in this type of pilot projects. Future energy system will need to be supplemented with energy storage and controls in this consumption stage. Energy storage for electricity, heating and cooling will become increasingly common. Achieving good results will require increased collaborations between producers and consumers. We must work more together in this issue. So we can take the next slide and then I think we go into my colleague Jonas Hansson will take over here. <clears throat> okay. Yes, um, in this building we have uh, built uh, solar panels and battery and uh, a DC network uh, and, and uh, the purpose for uh, for this uh, project uh, in this aspect was uh, to build uh, a demonstration facility that uh, contributes the, to uh, technology development in the DC battery and solar panels. Uh, it, we have uh, contributes to learning in the industry and contributes to research. And we have had uh, the Swedish uh, research institute uh, with us uh, in this project uh, like uh, BRF Weva uh, had, had the same uh, uh, thing um, and our goal with this was a fully functional facility integrated in the building infrastructure uh, and uh, the benefits uh, is uh, to show the potential advantage and uh, disadvantages to direct current system connected to energy storage and solar production uh, and uh, re reduce transmissions losses in higher efficiency compared with traditional alternating current system uh, next picture uh, there is a lot of text, uh, I'm not going to read everything, but uh, the, the purpose of the batteries is uh, to increase uh, the self-consumption from the solar cell production, just like uh, Per uh, just said, uh, uh, that's the, uh, how do I say, uh, that's the primary uh, thing oh. to, to do. Uh, in addition, uh, we connect the battery with the solar cells and loads in the building to avoid transmissions losses and uh, conversion steps. And I think to uh, uh, to uh, connect the the loads in the, in the building has has been the the most uh, problems with with that part. Uh, I come to that uh, later. Um, okay, we can take the next picture. Uh, here is some of the components we have used in in this uh, project. Uh, we have uh, had a uh, bi-directional inverter between the AC network and the DC network. Uh, it's uh, called an energy hub 
from uh, Ferramp. Uh, it's a Swedish company. Uh, and uh, the total uh, solar panels is about 177 kilowatts and the battery storage around 200 kilowatts. Um, and, and the loads in the building, it's, uh, it's uh, the most of the lighting in, in the buildings are direct uh, connected to the, oh, there it comes. Uh, yeah, the, the loads uh, is, is the lighting in the building. It's about uh, 1,300 uh, uh, fixtures. And uh, the ventilation uh, of the building is also uh, directly uh, connected to the, to the DC uh, system. And, and to do that, we have uh, DC switch gears, uh, DC control panels, and the distribution networks. Uh, you can take uh, the next big picture. Yes, here's a picture of, uh, uh, of uh, the total system. Uh, and the picture is uh, cut from our monitor system where we can follow the power flows in the systems. Uh, we can take in alarms to see the status and errors and so on. And uh, um, yeah, this is an overview for the, for the, for the systems. And, uh, and the, the blue lines here is the that's the DC network, uh, which is uh, 760 volt DC. Uh, and, and the orange lines, it's the AC uh, network, the normal uh, electrical grid. Uh, and in the, in the left side there, you can see the energy hub that connects the AC and DC. Uh, and can uh, transport uh, uh, power each way. Uh, yes, uh, next picture. Uh, here is some experience with the project and, and uh, uh, the collaborative formats. Uh, is one uh, extremely diverse skill converged in the higher complexity project that must work. Uh, all the lights and the fans in the building is uh, demand on on this uh, that this will work. Uh, we we can't uh, just uh, turn it off. Uh, it's it's a part of the infrastructure in the in the building. Uh, the battery, we can turn off the battery and we can turn off the solar cells, but uh, oh, uh, but we we, uh, we can't uh, turn off the DC networks because it uh, supplies the lightning and, uh, and the fans. Uh, one other thing is a relatively obsessed industry that uh, with a giving standards for uh, for alternative for alternating voltage. Uh, this is a hard thing to, to go around. We have a high voltage, it's 760 volts, uh, and uh, not so many things can uh, be supplied with that. Uh, uh, there is a limited knowledge of direct country, uh, current in the construction industry with the consultants, uh, constructors, suppliers, and so on. And to find the right people in the development depart department, uh, it's not so easy that uh, either. And um, Ferramp uh, has a central role in, in this uh, system uh, with, their, uh, uh, with their energy hub and uh, uh, we have 
they they, they are very good but they, they are also uh, de de development it takes time so it, it's not easy to 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 work with these uh, new things uh, and and just the uh, indicate monitoring alarms management and so on is is also a hard to work with um, And um, to compare the the when we sh shall install the the battery storage, it's um, it, it's not easy to uh, to compare different uh, batteries and uh, what parameters should be compared. Uh, brand new batteries are compared with used uh, vehicle batteries and so on and and how how. Uh, how shall we uh, uh, compare them? Uh, that's uh, that has been uh, a, a difficult uh, to uh, to go through. Yes, the next picture. There are some uh, technical problems also uh, that uh, we had. Uh, uh, It's uh, components without AC-DC phase and uh, the old rectifier, lightning fixtures, frequency convergence, and so on. Uh, they have been very hard to to, to find these uh, things to to uh, connect to the system, uh, and and that's uh, with a high voltage level, uh, 380. Uh, 760 volt DC. That's uh, not easy. Uh, and there have, have been some. Uh, oh, uh, it's, uh, <laughs> uh, there is some uh, startup problems uh, when we have uh, some other loads uh, that uh, not the loads. They are not controlled by the ferramp uh, systems. Uh, uh, and the ferramp system can't start with a black uh, net uh, when the loads are uh, uh, connected to to the system, and uh, so we have had some uh, issues to to solve that uh, problem. Uh, and the alarm management uh, is also. Difficult uh, to to uh, to do. Uh, there's a lack of uh, experience with the property of op operations and uh, controls, uh, and uh, the alarm management is difficult to understand or non-exist. Uh, yeah, and there's a lot of eat the IT components under the shell and uh, over the time how, how stable are they uh, these systems we uh, that we built in how for how many years are they still working uh, that's uh, some questions we can ask it and um, the design of the battery room uh, some other speakers has talked about that. Uh, how shall we? Uh, uh, work, how, how shall we take care of the fire, smoke hatch, uh, ventilations, heat dispersion, and cooling, and so on? Uh, there is no standards. Uh, we had to uh, to do this uh, with uh, best practice and. Uh, yeah, the, there is. Uh, there has been a very, very many questions to to come through this uh, project. Um, not easy. Yes. Yeah. Then I then I take over you, Jonas. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I will talk about another thing to 
to energy storage. Uh, today we talk about uh, electricity factory. Fair, sorry to interrupt you, but uh, we are run out of time. Oh, um, well, so give me two minutes. Two yeah, minutes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Go on. Yeah, I think it's, it's, we talk about the battery, of course, that's uh, electricity storage, but you can also use another storage. And uh, what we are testing is a PCM storage. We can operate um, our cooling machines. Normally they are electricity driven and store the cooling when the electricity price is low or the solar cells are producing a lot of Energy, energy, electric energy. And we don't store it in batteries, we store it in PCM storage instead. So we have tested that in this um, pilot project in IRIS. And you can take the next picture. Next picture. Yeah. Uh, this is a not electrical diagram, it's a piping. And the storage is here in the um, down in the right corner. And we load this PCM storage with cold water from the electricity driven cooling machines in the time where the electricity price is low. And then we take out the storage, the cooling storage when the price is high. That's the way normally as a normal battery, but we don't use electricity. We use the phase change material instead. There, and it's a very simple installation, not so very much uh, complicated things to, to get around with, but there is some problems. Can you give me the next slide? Here is a picture of the box. There is container. The container is like a battery container, but this is salt in this container. It's the same, um, nearly the same uh, volume as a battery i can say without uh, yes it's like the same volume as a battery kilowatt hour the next picture and uh, there's a lot of text here but what it says here is that we use as i said before we use this pcm storage to to uh, storage uh, cool cold water when the electricity price is low for our district uh, cooling machines and then we take it out of course when it's probably to best to do it we also use this storage to take the peak of course some uh, we have a uh, when we in Chalmers university campus area we have a big cooling uh, district system and uh, when we connected avl we didn't buy a new cooling machines we did we by this PCM storage instead. So we didn't have to in, in, uh, put money in new cooling machines. So we put it in the PCM storage instead of buying new machines. So that's one benefits also, of course. And you can take picture, next picture. Uh, some experience, project management, uh, we have a good good experience by the project management here. This uh, type of inst installation is uh, it's not common, but it's pipe valves and so on. So there are a lot of uh, companies who knows this, who can connect them and so on. So it's that was not a problem. The problem is uh, the knowledge of the PCM, of course, the PCM storage, the salt solution that we use in PCM, uh, the AVL building. And um, find the right people in, in, in development part departments for the PCM uh, pro project. And you have some, you can take the next picture also. Technical, uh, we think it's not so very much, uh, there, there is a, a difficult to find the right supplier. And uh, we come to, choose the supplier Rubiterm that we think is the right supplier, but there is a rather few of them out in the EU. EU. And um, the next thing is the performance. We have not yet get the right performance of the PCM storage. It's a problem, of course, if you buy something, you want to have the storage capacity, but we have just now maybe 50% of the capacity that we bought. So that's what we are working with now. And the control systems, um, 
we had not can you go back control systems is it's have been very complex systems that we put on too complex which could we should from the start not do it so very complex now we have restarted the system with much simplified functions to get the most important things to work the most important is to store and recharge it and go and go and go in the cycles mode so not so very complex system it's it's, it's today very much easier system that we had from the beginning that's what's our very short thing about pcm and uh, we are finished there we can stop there thank you very much thank you all we have a few minutes for uh, for questions so if there is any question please uh, this one question in the chat no may i ask a question <laughs> i don't know who is more suitable to to ask to answer um, regarding second life batteries do they have uh, uh, in terms of high of uh, safety regulations it is more strict uh, these safety regulations are more stricter for second life batteries or it's similar to the new ones uh, may i try half an answer yeah. you hear me? it's christian speaking um as you have seen i mean fire safety is not well treated anywhere by any means neither in first life batteries and as you've seen and has been said uh, second life batteries is yet a little bit terra incognita in terms of experience so um there is a lack actually there's a big gap there is no there is no directive on this issue i would say there is no regulation unfortunately on second life batteries yes if i may uh Bart van der Rey here from the netherlands um i have the same impression because i'm not an expert in in this but what i have seen is a few very early drafts of possible regulations and uh, what i have seen in those documents was a very limited knowledge and there's no good certification for instance so if you are a local authority there's not a lot that can give you confidence that this battery will be safe for 15 years if it is new or second life um uh i think anyway it is very new technology and this needs to be developed further thank you um i can say uh, i agree with uh Corner speakers here that it's a problem with the connection, the ET systems around the batteries, and also a little bit around the PCM. Uh, we take a lot of man hour to get them working together when we will connect the ET solutions around the batteries. Uh, it's a not common problem, I think, today. We have not come so far in that uh, area. Uh, Panos, I have one question, if that's oh, okay. Yeah, of course. Uh, <clears throat> regarding replicability, how do you see the potential there? Uh, looking from the fellow city view, if we should replicate it somewhere. But also, uh, we have been contacted by providers from the market that provides then battery storage uh, connected with uh, solar panels and uh, they seem to be quite standardized and i asked them uh, regarding all these questions and they say as long as you put the energy storage outside the building it's not a problem but uh, uh, basically two questions replicability of these uh, solutions and how do you look on the solutions uh, on the market today well i start with an answer uh, for us, as I said, I mean, we have no, uh, the main driver of batteries is not the economy as such. 
it's such a business model you're not uh, there's not really much much space to make uh, let's say uh, extra money with a battery i mean it's more uh, a cost and a revenue uh, nevertheless uh, there is really 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 strong political support everywhere uh, in terms of uh, let's say greening your energy system so there is quite of a potential i think already in connection with these two networks uh, and they're moving towards heat pumps so there we have this hybrid operation model between heating cooling and uh, the building itself which might be a producer and there is some work to do and we are working on that for example and that for us is one replication and moreover if this thing works uh, it's scalable very scalable um and there you really have an interest because there you have the public authority which mandates you with uh, being green as possible and maybe forget a little bit about uh, the overall uh, short term uh, let's say, uh, financial balance and so you're able also to to postpone uh, let's say a return investment in long term because you're under usually uh, 20 25 year contracts so that's one way we are going in that question uh, second point is industry industry they are working on that so i mean they are not very keen but well there are some of them they want to get rid of the diesel motors um and giants so uh there is some space for that typically also hospitals uh, so they're very specific sectors which uh, things are going on i mean it's emerging um but the challenge and the challenge to address here is really the, the, the tertiary uh buildings before we go into the housing which is even more complicated um so well uh just as individual uh, sector in tertiary buildings in an urban build-up environment which has no uh, grid constraints uh, i think we have to come up with a, with a thinking which can connect together political ambition environmental ambition uh, labeling uh, and local generation and bring up use cases which make sense uh, for at least a certain part of the pool of customers um well and then the problem is we're talking about france but if you move on to uh, other countries and which uh, company like edf might be operating or others uh, well you have other another market design you have another grid code and well and there 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 makes sense it makes sense to make peak shifting and peak shaving uh, it makes sense to uh, uh, to downscale your uh, your supply contract and uh, try to hedge with it with batteries within uh, let's say large ecosystem that are functioning behind. So far, for my part. Thank you. Hi, this is Eva. Uh, I was wondering uh, uh, if uh, Ilva, if you wanted to tell us uh, something about the solution uh, that you have uh, discussed with us about uh, the second-hand batteries being used in a space and a real estate in Gothenburg, um, but not the BRFV. It's, it's another uh, real estate, and you looked at some solutions that uh, the the batteries um, were separated from the from the data sensors or the cells I, uh, sorry i mean the the battery cells i think is that correct maybe Ilva is not here more she's uh, here she is here uh, yeah. she's muted Okay. She's muted. Well, maybe we can tell you about this uh, another time. Il Ilva knows much more than me. Yeah. In fact, we want to organize another workshop for batteries for these systems after uh, the operate after collecting data on uh, operation of the systems because, uh, as the speakers told you before neither in Utrecht nor in Nice the systems are yet are fully operational yet so this is a very interesting topic to have a follow-up after let's say one year of operation yes but uh, to highlight the, what Eva just said is that uh, this uh, uh, second life battery has already been uh, uh, replicated in Gothenburg in a real estate building that is not within the project so 
So maybe that could also be part of that second webinar or an upcoming thing because it's really inspiring and also bringing some new aspects as Eva said um, that it's it's not exactly a copy of what's being uh, demonstrated here in Iris but uh, a development of that so it, it's a lot of good learnings I think key takeaways because the people are involved in the other uh, in that uh, replication I, I'm pretty sure that they do this because they're not doing it for fun they do it for because it's good for them it's like good business in the end yes thank you Rilke. i have a question uh, regarding second life batteries i mean it's maybe deviating from what you're talking about but um on one side, we have really practical application on second life batteries, and we are uh, waiting to get, uh, let's say, data out of it, which is stringently needed. Let's say for uh, at least, uh, let's say, the wider community, and maybe industrial people might have what they need uh, and what they need. Anyway, um, question is: If we also, is there any task in the project which addresses, let's say, the wider scope and the wider ecosystem around uh, second life batteries? Um, so. Uh, and my, my thinking is, um, we, we're talking about it might be good to have uh, reused these batteries from the vehicles, etc. But I mean, there are regulation norms which forces uh, battery, let's say the automobile industry and battery producers to recycle most of the uh, of the uh, of the uh, of the batteries, and which for them is already an obligation. So uh, they already have a second life going on, and moreover. Um, there are many research going on in which revamping chemically revamping the second life batteries they make them as performing as uh, as uh, new ones so the second life is already a repurposing of them so uh, there might be other ways to explore instead of just saying i take out my car the battery from my car i put it on a rack i connect it to a to control system and uh, with a nice inverter and use them for a stationary application is there any any task or any any partner or anyone that, that, that um, works on this, let's say, more general reflection, more systemic uh, type of uh, vision on second life batteries? Mm, no, in terms of task in the project, uh, no, there isn't any task related uh, related to this. Okay, thanks. I was just wondering it. Is there any other question? Okay. So um, we can finish uh, the workshop here. Uh, we will upload the video in the Iris uh, website. Thank you all for your effort and uh, we'll keep in touch and discuss uh, in another web workshop the findings of the operation of the battery energy storage systems. Thank you all and uh, stay safe. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye.